Welcome everybody to the Core Connection. I'm Mira Rubin, and I am so excited to welcome you to uh, to a new week. With we're shaking it up a bit. I actually have a guest today for the very very first time, and I'm not even going to introduce her until we take a minute to settle in. So. Uh, before we get started, let's just take a deep breath in through your nose, hold it and imagine all that oxygen just coursing through your bloodstream, coursing through your body, enlivening all your cells. And as you exhale, exhale any tension, any stress in your neck, in your jaw, in your back, your shoulders. And now let's take another deep breath in through your nose, hold it. And this time, just imagine sparkling white light moving throughout your being and beyond into your environment and expanding and relax and re exhale any remaining tension. And then let's just gently, pray, plus, <laughs> gently press our palms together and softly rub your fingers against your palms so that you can feel the tingling in your fingers and the tingling in your palms and the deliciousness of being in this physical body and bring yourselves present right here, right now. Welcome. And I am really excited. This is a whole new thing for the Core Connection. Sharon Ray, welcome. I'm just going to give a very brief introduction. Uh, Sharon is an author, a life and family coach, and founder of the global movement, No Judgment, Just Love. And uh, we've been talking about all the things that are happening right now in the world. And what we're discussing today is current events, uh, particularly around social justice, police reform, racial biases, and COVID-19. And here's a really even cooler thing than the conversation we're gonna be having is that right after you're invited to join us, on what we're calling a comfy couch. And so actually probably we'll have a five minute break in between depending on how late we go with this conversation. And uh, the comfy couch is open to up to, what do we say, 10, 15 people? Yeah, something like that. And um, it's really just an opportunity for an intimate, candid conversation and uh, all love, no judgment. Mm. And um, where we just really get to dig deep into feelings and perspectives and sharing and connecting to uh, find our way through these very interesting and very challenging times in so many ways. And I just want to give huge uh, kudos to Sharon, Sharon because it is six o'clock in the morning where she is on the West Coast and look how fresh and gorgeous she is. And I just am so grateful to you, Sharon, for being here with us today. Thank you. Mira, thank you so much. I'm honored. This is going to be fun and insightful. And I'm, I'm really happy to be with you this morning. Thank you for inviting me. It's, it's my pleasure. And, and a great time to be shaking things up even more, right? Yes. So, um, and I love being able to have somebody to talk to, so, you know, rather than generating all this stuff, people have been having all kinds of opportunity to be playing in my head lately, but yes. <laughs> we get to talk, which is great. So um, Sharon, you are part of Enlightened World Network. Yes. Yes, and I so am. I'm thinking, you know, maybe uh, let's talk. This is the reason you're here is because you actually reached out, you and Ruth Anderson together, and we're here on Enlightened World Network. You and Ruth Anderson, who's the founder of Enlightened World Network, brainstormed together to be looking at how to address what's going on in the world right now from a spiritual perspective, particularly <laughs> with what's showing up with race and and our our new awakenings and renewed awakenings about justice and equity and and all the stuff that's coming up around this guilt and shame and anger and 
hurt and and then you guys brought this to other people myself included who are on enlightened world network and came up with this brilliant idea so i'm going to ask you to sort of explain what this what where this comes from yeah thank you ruth i'm ruth myra i'm happy to do that <laughs> mira holy cow it's early you know, sorry it's, <laughs> it's really funny it's funny because i'm using ruth's zoom and originally the name said ruth anderson so i changed <laughs> it so, you can call me ruth anytime <laughs> thank you and pardon me if my eyes keep going to the side i have the other um Facebook open so I can watch. So hello, Sally. I see people coming in. Um, so, so I'm just every I, I'm gonna leave it to you if you would um, to check into the comments. And folks, what we're gonna do is we're gonna chat for a bit, then we'll check the comments and respond to comments and how you can come to the comfy couch, by the way, um, after this. And and we kind of left it open-ended because we figured if we got engaged in a really awesome conversation that we would keep it going for a while yeah um, it'll go no more than an hour right uh, but we're anywhere from figuring 9 30 to 10 o'clock for an end time and then comfy couch after that uh if you want to join us for the comfy couch it's not going to be here on this zoom what you need to do is to message sharon because she's the person womaning the uh the <laughs> facebook feed and and um the messenger okay yes. so um are there any comments that you want to share right now uh just i see sally she says hello ladies and okay, that's where sally. we are so far i think but enlightened that, world network uh gave us two claps two high fives <laughs> oh that's that's dido dido comes and supports on every day so welcome dido she's brilliant she has amazing insight and she's she's just uh a really phenomenal support so okay thank you for uh, your dido wonderful all right so i am sharon ria i'm out here in sunny getting ready to be really hot arizona <laughs> i am the founder of the global movement no judgment just love and just to share a little bit about that mira um when i started my coaching business which is called the whole family coaching and i work a lot with families who are in transitions raising teenagers <laughs> going through divorce fathers taking on the primary role of parenting grandparents doing that wonderful job of raising their grandchildren even though their children can't be in the picture and basically helping families communicate because just as a general population, I think we have uh, not embraced the fact that everyone doesn't speak the way we do. Everyone doesn't use the words the way we do. Meanings are different to different people. And in a family, we don't recognize that enough that often it becomes very difficult to speak with the people that are closest to us. So I am like a, a, an intermediate ambassador. <laughs> So I get to hear one side and hear the other side and help them understand what each other is saying. And so in that space, as a new entrepreneur, never been a, never had my own business, people were sharing with me what I should do here and what I should do there. And they said, you need a tagline. You need something that will help you describe what it is you do. Well, I thought the whole family was pretty descriptive, <laughs> but in came these four words no judgment just love and when and they just divinely walked into my space and they resonated with me so much mira because i think that's who i have been been becoming all my life is someone i'm an only child and i love people i don't know what my mom and dad were thinking <laughs> So I was always outside playing with my friends or inviting people over. I really, really love people. And so with no judgment, just love, it's not that we don't judge. That's not what I'm saying with those four words. I'm asking you to let that be your ideal because we judge all the time, every day with everything. And that is so human and so appropriate. 
that when you judge, and you will, I'm asking just like you started out the show this morning, take a pause. Take a pause and rise up to what I call your GPS. That's your greatest personal shift. Nice. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> and when, yes and when you can do that wherever that takes you is to the place where you know better about what you just judged whether that be yourself or someone else and so in that space I've been doing uh, this movement for six years in a number of different ways I have I have one here I have magnets, I have a charm, I speak on it, I've taught it to children, little kindergartners, middle schoolers who are That's part of chart. That's yes, right? Yeah. <laughs> and middle schoolers, especially, that's my favorite age to invite into the space of no judgment, just love, because as you probably went through middle school as I did, there's a whole lot of judgment going on between those sweet young people. And they're just ready for someone to pour love into them, to let them know they are valuable and they're worthy. And so in Enlightened World, I think last year was uh, when Ruth began and I was one of the first ones that got to interview with her. So I've had a wonderful relationship with this community, but I haven't found it to be as diverse as the world. Not at and all. so, no, it, it's really not. And I mean, it's diverse and, and it's- and, and, and we have to say, it's absolutely not by design. It's just that that's how it seems to have shown up so far, which is really strange. It is. And, and that in, started the conversation between Ruth and I about a month ago. Um, she had had an idea to have this conversation unbeknownst to me. I had an idea to create a space for people because of the pandemic and then that ensued the Black Lives Matter movement. And myself, I was having a struggle. How do I fit into this conversation? I know I have a voice. I know I have something I want to say, but I was very tender with myself because I wasn't quite sure. I have a lot of history that was bubbling up for me, which I imagined was bubbling up for other people. And I didn't have what I felt was a safe space to just talk about how I felt without having to do something, without having to take action, without having to explain myself or be debated. And so in conversation with Ruth, those two things were the topic. How do we create more diversity in enlightened women naturally, you know, organically? And then how do we help people uncover What's coming up for them with this racial conversation in our country? And so one of the phrases that I have with no judgment, just love, I have a, a gray couch in my uh, living room. And when clients would come, this couch is very soft and snuggly and they'd sit in the couch and they go, oh, I feel so comfy here. And I was like, oh, I have a comfy couch. <laughs> And so we entitled it the Comfy Couch Forum, the Comfy Couch Conversation. And what it is, is just like you described, it's a private, safe space for people to do two things. One, to just share a story, uncover what you're feeling, and know that people will listen and love you no matter what you have to say, no matter what you have to say. And at the same time, everyone else is muted and they get to listen. And that is an activity that we don't do a lot here, at least in our country. We don't listen really to people. Listening is a skill because listening without judgment, not trying to think about what you're having for dinner or think about, well, that doesn't matter or say, oh, I have something to say along with that which interrupts a person's thought process. And our brains need to have continual flow in order for us to really hear what's inside of us. Well, I think that, first of all, I commend you for your courage and, and your willingness to be, be the voice of diversity, you know, in, in the midst of uh, a community that is predominantly white 
And um, I think it's really important, really important for all of us to be able that to, to share and to have that environment that you're creating, you know, and it's a gift, it's a gift to all of us. So I, I really, really deeply appreciate it and appreciate you. And you and I had a wonderful, wonderful conversation together. And I thought it would be great if we could introduce some of those things that we talked about. And uh, you mentioned languaging already. And uh, there has been some very provocative languaging, even just Black Lives Matter oh, yeah. has been, has, has caused a lot of, or been the, the uh, uh, stimulant for a lot of controversy, misunderstanding and, um, and in a spiritually oriented community, you know, the response, all lives matter. And what does that mean? I, I did want a show about that oh, okay. uh, here, um, but it was just me. And I, what I did was I read an article about why people should stop saying all lives matter because oh. it's kind of misinterpreting what black lives matter means. And I thought you and I could engage in a conversation around that. And also the notion <laughs> of defunding the police because that also was a very uh, provocative idea and it's interesting to see, you know, how it's playing out in policy and in different communities. So I thought mm -hmm. maybe we could focus some of our attention on talking about those things. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm glad to hear the conversation around language because um, being <laughs> in the middle of the conversation of Black Lives Matter, because obviously the, I'm Black, but <laughs> I do have, I do live in Scottsdale, which not, is not very diverse. So, um, and I'm, I'm from New York and from Maryland. So I've lived in a lot of different around, in and around a lot of different cultures. And what it is happening for me, Mira, is Black Lives Matter is a rally call of I exist. Right. I'm here. And, and these words will incite you. These words will hurt you. These words will hopefully open you up and inspire you. Mm. These words are a collaborative cry for the people that are Black, that we are in solidarity together. And so I personally hear it in a number of different ways. But just like Black Lives Matter might hurt and a have a difficult time for some people. White privilege does the same thing. Oh, yeah. I have a problem with that one because I think it's misinterpreted of, oh, I, I, I'm not privileged. I had to work hard for my things that I have. I didn't come up from, you know, a silver spoon in my mouth, but that's not the intent in my view of those words. So I think it's important to have the opportunity to step back. That's why that GPS is so important. Of course, we're gonna judge when you hear Black Lives Matter. Of course, you're gonna judge when you hear white privilege. But take a step back and do what you do, which is explore. Try to understand, not just have a knee-jerk reaction to how it hit you. Yeah, well, uh, and let's, let's talk about that. I mean, for, for me, really uh, digging into the notion around Black Lives Matter and the meaning of those words, it was profoundly helpful and enlightening for me to read that article that said it's not, the, the, the subtext is not only Black Lives Matter. The subtext more would be Black, of course all lives matter, Black Lives Matter too. And it hasn't been, um, it, it, Black lives have not been treated in the same way with the same respect and the same value. Correct. It, it, right. With, and so, of course, all lives matter. And that's where we're headed. 
But right now, if we need to see where we haven't lived that way. Exactly. And, you know, it's, it's interesting that we're here in this conversation as the evolution of just the last seven or eight months, because the last seven or eight months, remember, we were in the Me Too conversation where women were saying, we matter as well. And this has happened to more than us, more of us than you really know. Yes. And people were coming out with their pain and coming out with their stories. Yes. And so these opportunities for each group, so to speak, to have their day in the sun, because we've all had our time where we've been abused, misused, and mis disrespected. But the Black Lives Movement, to me, is a culmination, and still, of us not really being a part of this American conversation in a way that is equitable, in a way that has respect, in a way that is honored. And so I agree with you. It's almost like when I'm working with a family that has three or four children and one child is having a great struggle with whatever it is, school, drugs, whatever it is, the parent doesn't go, oh, I love all my kids. Right. Of course you do. But right now you have to pay attention to this one. Right. Right. Exactly. I love that you made the parallel with the Me Too movement. Because as, and I think that that's a great perspective, you know, if we zoom up to have a broader view, we get to see that there is emergent uh call an emergent call for equity and justice and not just in individual groups it's showing up that way mm -hmm. but what it's the greater mission the greater vision is to get to a place where we can create that equity and right now by by really engaging in black lives matter what it's bringing up is inequities that affect all of us <laughs> and that's yes. the thing is like um the that that we have marginalized different groups or ignored the um the plight of different groups and with the me too movement and with with indigenous peoples and you know that we need to wake up to our internal prejudices you were talking about no judgment just love well and we judge all the time and the thing that this has brought forward for me and so many other people is recognizing how deep the the judgments go that are completely unconscious yes they're invisible because they're so deeply entrenched. And Mira, I, my, oh, sorry, Mira, I have, you know, it's funny because when this happened uh, on Saturday, I didn't want to share it because I was guilty. I was embarrassed. I was shocked. But I find that I'm, you know, I'm listening to voices always that say, okay, talk about this or move here. And you all in the spiritual world know that we have our inner being guiding us to say certain things. I'm like, I don't want to tell this story. And I hear story. <laughs> this, this, well, first of all, this is where courage comes in because it takes a tremendous amount of courage to have the willingness to look deeply into ourselves and see the things that bring shame. And that's one of the things that I think this whole movement has stimulated in a lot of people is it is a shame that is like, oh my gosh, look at my, yes. my beingness. Look at, and I have, I have spoken about that too, where these voices or these words show up in my brain and it's like, whoa, where did that come from? I'm mortified that that was in my head. And I don't even know where it came from. Exactly. And so just as a prelude to whatever it is you're going to share here. I, I, but it is ingrained. It is uh, taught. It is um, 
just it infiltrates us without e even knowing some of these things that come are coming up now for us to heal and and let go of so there is a video that uh john cena he's a wrestler and he's become an actor um is walking down a street and he's talking about the average american and he gives a lot of statistics about 50 percent of america are women so the average american could be a woman a woman and he gives all these statistics about different cultures, different races, different genders. But before he goes through all of that, at the beginning of his talk, he says, I'd like you to close your eyes and imagine in your mind's eye, what to you is an average American? My face did not come up in my mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was a twisty turny between a white face woman and a white face man. Mm. And when I opened my eyes, it was like, I don't even see myself, even though I say it, I say the words, obviously in my subconscious, that's not really the first thing that comes to mind, which was shocking and took me down for pretty much the whole day. Wow. Wow. And so you're right to be courageous, to allow these moments to be shown to you and to be even more courageous to sit in them. Yes. Yes. And not say, no, not black lives matter. All lives matter. Cause I can't sit with that one right now. Right. That's how you said it, it leveled you for the day. So how did you move through that? Well, first of all, my comfort couch was very helpful. <laughs> I'll bet. I'll bet. Because I hung out on it all day. But, um, you know, I went through my childhood and I lived in a diverse uh, middle class community in Maryland. And our community was a product of desegregation, which I didn't realize until I was older. I just thought, how come they get to have a bus just because they're on the other side of the highway and I have to walk? Um, but it, it was uh, mostly black and white, maybe one or two Asian families were there. And we didn't have, in my view, in my experience, any prejudice, it was just economics. You know, were you in the same economic space or did you live up there where the rich people lived or way over there where people that had less lived? But I do remember, I don't know if you know the um, uh, comedy show Who Whoopi Goldberg, where she puts a towel on her head and she says, it's my long flowing blonde hair. Well, no, <laughs> well I don't know that one. <laughs> She's pretending to be a valley girl and she's, you know, making okay. your hair go. <laughs> and I didn't want my hair to be blonde, but I wanted it to be long and flowing. And I grew up with history that, you know, there were no real black people talked about in our history. And so I went through that part of my childhood to try and put to, to some understanding, how did I get here? Yeah. And then, you know, in the spirituality space is what really brought me to peace. Because maybe this was coming up for me right now because we're in a transition, hopefully to the fifth dimension and to higher places where we all can embrace the fact that yes, not only of course, the all lives matter, but all lives matter in our um, uniqueness that we can see each other as valuable and unique at the same time. Yeah. And so what I thought was, I don't see boundaries. It really frustrates me when people put up walls and lines and this versus that, this country versus that country. So what I concluded, Mira, that brought me some peace was, hmm, maybe I don't have to look at this as a guilty, shameful image that I didn't show up as an American, because I am humanity. Mm. Oh, that's beautiful. If we could all know that, 
what a paradigm shift that would be. Yes. You know, it occurs to me, could you check it, take a peek at the messages, see if there's yes. any comments? Uh, Sally says, absolutely. And I think she was responding to you. She says, I say that listening is 85% of life and we have to see them or we will not heal them. And therein lies the comments. Sally, thank you for being here. <laughs> <laughs> and engaging. Absolutely. And engaging, yes, yes. So um, let's talk about white privilege. Yes, let's. Because um, that's an incendiary phrase. Yes, so, it is. Yeah. And I think that it is uh, descriptive if you can move past what your initial hurtful judgment of those two words are. Uh, well, I'm really interested in your take. I have several takes on it myself, but I, I would really be interested to hear what you say. The, the way that I view it is through a small personal experience that I have. When I go into Target, let's say, to shop, and I walk in, I walk around the store and I don't see what I want. On my way out, in my head, how do I leave this store so no one thinks I'm trying to steal something since I didn't buy something? Wow. How many people of non-color have that thought going in and out of anything? Yeah. Um... There, I have to say that I have had moments of that myself, but I do not live with that as a pervasive thought by yes. any stretch of the imagination. And there are times when I have chosen to not have a bag, to not get a bag and walk out with the item. Yes. You know, and it's like uh, carrying the receipt, but I can, Im I, I can only imagine uh, what it must be like to have that be a perpetual conversation. It's, and it is. Yeah. And it's not because of the, the item with no disrespect. It's because of my skin color. Yes, it is. And, and I have to choose to walk. I, I mean, I literally stand, should I go in an aisle that has no cashier? Should I go past a cashier? Okay, how do I walk? Do I walk? I mean, this is, this is the constant. And sometimes, I mean, I don't have it all the time. But again, I'm here in Scottsdale. Right that is not diverse. So there's not a lot of people like me shopping in the store and I shouldn't have that thought. I'm not gonna steal anything. No. I know that, but yet I don't feel comfortable that way. Right. And, and um, I, I have had experience being in a store with a black friend and you know, having people that are working in the store looking at us suspiciously and and I, I, I know friends who have been followed around stores. You know, I've, I've really never had anybody follow me around the store that, you know, to watch to see if I'm going to steal something, you know. That it's and very see, that's the presumption that the words white privilege don't include or are trying to highlight. You have the privilege of your skin color to move around the world unencumbered. Th yeah. there's, there's not a presumption that you're in a, a wrong space, that you're gonna do something, that you are threatening, that you are uh, someone to be fearful of. You just move around the world in our country. And people of color do not have that same privilege. Yeah. That's how I, See you it. know, that's a, that's a really beautiful take on or explanation of that phrase because the, the response that I've heard is I worked hard or I really struggled or there are a lot of people who are a lot better off than I am, people of color and things, you know, that kind of conversation. Um, and the truth is you really hit the nail on the head because with, with the freedom to move around, the privilege to move around without those suspicions, 
opens many more doors also. Yeah. And the, the unfortunate comments that come my way, I would imagine, and you can please correct me, do people say, oh, Mira, you speak so well for being uh -huh. Black. Oh, wow. I mean, oh, what? That's, wow. What are you talking about? Wow. Or you don't sound Black. Are you sure you are? If I'm on the phone. I, I, you know, those, not are you sure you are, but I've had those comments. Well, but I went to acting school. I used to have very Southern Southern accent. And in acting school, you got to get rid of that. So... <laughs> <laughs> so I, I learned to speak the language in a way that I can adjust it to be an actress and it just became a part of me wow wow it didn't change the color of my skin it's interesting well that, you know that's another bias that we have is about the way that people speak and and there's judgment that comes from that those assumptions as well yeah very interesting, very interesting. And so I, I, I encourage people to do just what you and I are doing, have conversation, but, but come to the table with a new thought after you've had your own thought. You know, of course, debate it in the way that you have heard, but then look outside of that to see, is that really the only way to view this, whatever you're debating? because there's so many ways, there's so many, many ways from people's experiences to have a different take on what may cause us pain or what we may flippantly just disregard. Well, I think that we tend to disregard things that may cause us pain, you know? And this is the time for humanity, not just through I mean, Black Lives Matter is a gift in that it's waking a lot of us up to start doing a much deeper internal um, inventory. Yes. And uh, allowing us the context to really explore more deeply. Do we have some more comments there? Yeah, I'm seeing Sally. She says, I um, love the two of you separately as well as together. Thank you, Sally. And then she says, I had that happen at a farm here. Ironically, it was named White City Farms. Oh. <laughs> I still didn't get it until I caught them following me all around. Not the white people, but me. Yeah. What a nightmare. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Sally. Yes, that took courage too. Thank you yes. very much. Sally, I hope you'll join us on the comfy couch after yes. our conversation. Um, I, I thought maybe we could take a quick look at the idea of defunding the police and what that is because it's, it's a rather incendiary <laughs> phrase. Um, yes, it is. Actually, especially as people are, I think that there's more of an atmosphere of fear, um, be partly because of, co like to a large degree because of COVID, um, people are, are tentative about what the future is gonna bring. And, and then the idea that police are supposed to protect us. And then the idea of how, or the recognition of how much abuse of power there has been within police forces. Um, how do you go about resolving something that, about that, like that? And what happens if we dissolve the police force? You know, like that, is that what defund the police means? And um, I just wanted to explore that a bit with you too. Sure, do you wanna go first and share your perspective? Well, I, you know, I've done a little bit more reading and for the most part, I don't, my understanding is that it, it really is not necessarily, although I have seen calls to dissolve the police forces, but um, that it's a call to maybe reallocate funds, a lot of funds and 
to be looking, it, it seems like it's a super extreme statement that will potentially move us in a better direction. I don't know that the expectation is truly to defund the police, but to maybe redirect some of the funds to social services and, and uh, community services that will support uh, a more a more effective uh, support for communities. So I was reading, I was reading about a, a group in Seattle that has been active for years and years and they work in consort with the police department and they are mental health and EMT services where a lot of police get called into these situations that they're really not trained to be able to address. And so many of the uh, violent interactions between community and police is, is related to mental health issues. And so this, this organization had a van and they had people, EMTs and mental health professionals, and they would get called out. The dispatchers would send them to the, the circumstances that were more up their alley, so to speak. And they, they completed something like 2,400 calls. And out of those 2,400 calls, only 125 of them or so needed police backup. And it created greater affinity within the community, greater trust, greater support, and I just read about, um, I think it might have, I'm, I'm afraid to say where I read it, that another community is instituting something like this, where they're working in consort with the police departments, which is brilliant. Yes. <clears throat> I, I think that that is excellent uh, direction for the, like you said, the incendiary phrase of defund the police. And, and words just so matter, Mira, they just really matter. And I can imagine, just like at least I believe in our spiritual community, when you have a pain in your side or you have a pain in your arm, there's a, a willingness to, to say, oh, what does this mean? What does this mean emotionally? Why is this my body now showing up? But for many people, a pain is something you take a pill to get rid of or right. I drink to not feel it, or I go do something else to not feel it. And the pain of how the police have been viewed and some of them have conducted their jobs is painful. It's life-threatening. And so those for words- everybody. For but, everybody. Yes, yes, yes. So those words are your aspirin, your drink with the girls just make it go away. Defund the police, we just don't want it at all. And so, like you said, it's like a pendulum goes to one side that's extreme. So hopefully it can shake and wake people up to be able to have those conversations about mental health professionals. We have that, or at least we, I was on a task force that was creating that a couple of years ago here in Phoenix, because there are a lot of calls that come where someone just really is in a mental health crisis. And they do need a medical or a social worker or some other professional to help them with their mental health, not to handcuff them. Right. Exactly. So that just causes more stress and anxiety. And they danger. Do. And danger. Right. For both. So yes. yeah, um, it's interesting in terms of statistics, there are a lot of <clears throat> white people who have been shot by police as well. Yes. And the, so, and that's not to minimize and not to, you know, to try and deflect the attention. But I think that one of the most amazing things that's happening out of this movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, is that it is putting a spotlight on the way that we do law enforcement. And, you know, this is a bigger collective issue 
because it doesn't just touch the police department, Black Lives Matter, and have not been treated equitable or with reverence. This is the schools. That's right. The insurance companies. This is our government. This is families, community. I mean, it's just so wide and deep. And our prison system. And our prison system. Please not forget that. Yeah. But here's my thought about defunding the police that um, I agree with everything the article said and that you said that it is uh, appropriate to reevaluate how many funds are available to have community organizations that I believe, and I don't know for sure right now are mostly nonprofits. So they're having to get their own funding. And so if some of that city funding can be allocated to those other and, and then have a relationship so it doesn't become them over here and the police over here, have some kind of uh, bridge so that everybody understands that they are there, even so much so that the community understands. So when they call, they're calling to say, my brother has a mental condition and now he's out of control. I'm calling 911, but what I really need is this because they have awareness that this exists. Exactly. The other thing that I've thought a lot about, I'm old enough to remember, and I watch TV a lot, I'm a TV kid, when the police were called peace officers. Yes. And when you have a title that's a peace officer, you have a very different motivation than a police uh, law and order. Enforcement. Enforcement. That just, the whole two phrases are juxtapositioned to give us definition to what's happening now. Yes. And communities are not orderly. People are not orderly. Just as a community doesn't mean they're dangerous. There's just, there's a flow. And so I've seen an article in Canada where a police department incorporates yoga and meditation in the morning before they go out. You just did the perfect segue because I was thinking about, uh, I was having a conversation with a friend about the, um, the prison system. And uh, she said, what would it be like if the prisoners had a daily meditation or mindfulness practice? And then we said, well, what would it be like if the wardens and the guards also had a mindfulness meditation practice. And then we started talking about the police and what if the police forces had a mindfulness meditation practice? It yes. would make all the difference in the world. Yes, yes it would. And you shift the name because the name has a resonant energy. Letters and words have a vibration. Yes. And peace officer, even, even the word officer, <laughs> could be shifted to a, another word. Peacekeeper. Peacekeeper. You know, be a part of the community. Know the community that you're policing. Therein lies the defunding to hire more police than it can actually be in the community and fit in, not because of the color, but because of their constitution. That yeah. they understand what this community is about, and there they can be a police, I'm sorry, a peacekeeper. Instead That's of, what you want. You want to keep the peace. Instead of law enforcement. Yeah. Interesting. Do we have any other comments? Just Sally said a yes with two hearts, and thank you, Sally. I don't know what that was for, but there she goes. <laughs> okay, well, so I'm thinking that maybe we, I, I think we've covered a lot of territory maybe we can wrap up and invite anybody here to who's uh listening to join us for the comfy couch yes and, um it is now the way that you can do that actually is if you want to do that you need to right now um message on messenger message sharon and I'm going to put a comment with my name. So if you don't have my name. Okay. Oh, okay. Here's Faye Goshalk Williams. Good afternoon, ladies. Have you heard of the affinity program? 
A TV program was aired called The School That Tried to End Racism. Ooh. Wow. Thank you. That's interesting. Yes. Is there a link? You're out of screen right now. I don't know if there's anything you can do about that. There you are. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's my left hand that uh, <laughs> okay. does the okay. typing and I, um, I'm trying to enter. So anyway, if you're interested in joining us in the comfy couch, it's really going to be an unrecorded, candid conversation, intimate conversation to really just talk about what your experiences are and and to connect with one another so if you would uh, message sharon then we can send you a link and what we'll do is it's 9 50 right now uh eastern time what we'll do is we'll start at 10. what do you think of that sharon perfect i'll go get a little breakfast <laughs> okay so has has anybody messaged you not yet Okay, so we'll wait a few minutes, and if not, then we'll just not do the comfy couch, but this yeah. has been really delightful. Oh, for me as well. I enjoy the space that you've created, Mira. It's comfortable, it's enlightening, and very, very valuable. Thank you for having me. Thank you, and thank you for your candor and, and your really expansive view. I, I think I that, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. I just, you know, I love that we have the commonality of a spiritual perspective because what I find more often is it's difficult for me to make peace with and sense of what happens in our physical world because it's often painful. I don't understand. But when I have that opportunity to oh, use my GPS, and go up to the place where everyone is valued, everyone matters, all things have a reason, a season, or they're here for a lifetime, then I can really come back with a broader perspective yeah. to bring down to conversations such as what we're having. And I think that that's a really big gift and takeaway from this conversation for anyone that's listening is, is remember that we're spirit having a human experience and we get to we get to elevate our awareness to be able to live into that yes yeah and in that space everyone is magnificent even if you don't see it that's right and we all came here for a purpose we're all our voices all matter and we get to be shaping the new future together. Yes. And I just see Sally said, I can't, I'm trying, but I can't get out of video to message Sharon. Sally, I'm going to, when we take our pause, I'm going to go to you and send you the link. So don't worry about getting out um, of the video. I will send it to you. Okay, cool. And is there anybody else? We're going to give it another two minutes. So I guess Sharon, you're going to have, five minutes for breakfast <laughs> yeah. That's right. i put my toast in the toaster already so all i'll do is pop oh, it down <laughs> okay so, so uh, i'm gonna go off the screen and let you talk i'm gonna send sally and then go get my toast okay okay so it might just be the three of us that'll be beautiful okay i'm looking forward to it so Sarah, thank you so much i'll see you on the comfy couch <laughs> all right thanks so much for joining us sharon so um, this is, let me just shift our view here. Whoops. Um, I would have thought that that would make me show, but it didn't. So anyway, um, if, you, if you would like to join us on the comfy couch, please message Sharon Ray. And uh, we're just gonna have an intimate conversation to explore what it's been like to be experiencing uh, COVID and Black Lives Matter and what kinds of revelations these these moments have brought about for you. So I'm going to wrap up. I'm Mira Rubin here on Enlightened World Network. This is The Core Connection. And I'm here every weekday morning at 9 a.m. Eastern 
and uh, this was our first guest opportunity, which was wonderful. And I hope to see you back here again in the future. Uh, please, please check out all the wonderful programming on Enlightened World Network. And hopefully I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>